Well, that's true. Well, I feel like it's somehow along the way, this would end up happening for you. This would end up happening yeah, for you. Yeah, you never know. You never know. In a parallel reality. <laughs> exactly. Parallel realities, timelines, all these different things that we could maybe potentially get into. We'll find right. out. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so your story, though. Your story. Um, hmm. I'm really curious what the catalyst was <clears throat> that led to this great awakening of yours to see beyond your own reality and be and what inspired you to share all these universal truths um before you even found youtube share these universal truths with mm -hmm. even your intimate family which i could imagine given the fact that you know you grew up in a very christian family was not mm -hmm. easy so i'm really curious how this all sparked yeah well, I, I kind of feel like I've had a number of quote unquote awakenings mm -hmm. over the years. Um, the first one was awakening from religion, you know, fundamentalism. Um, I left my church job. I was a full-time worship pastor and uh, I just was exposed to a lot of um, sort of what I would call obnoxious theologies that didn't sit right with um, and so I was like, you know, I don't believe in this hell stuff. I don't believe the Bible is the inerrant dictated word of God. I don't believe any of that stuff. It doesn't, that's not the God I know in my heart. So I left the church. I moved back to Oklahoma where I had gone to college and was just going to devote my life to seeking the truth, you know, because, uh, even as growing up as a kid, the only thing that ever mattered to me was my faith. And, uh, I always had a really sincere desire to know God. Um, yeah. I always felt different than other kids because like all i cared about was god and metaphysics and what's the truth of why we're here and even as a little kid you know and um always being really sensitive uh to my intuition and emotions and stuff and didn't know many people like that so um you know i spent a couple years as a loner in junior high i just couldn't find friends that i resonated with <clears throat> and so 23 years old left the church and then it was when i was 27 I believe I had, um, you know, like a spiritual awakening and I had already been listening to, I was already, I believed all the metaphysical concepts, the new age stuff, whatever you want to call it. Um, oneness, all that good stuff. And I was desiring freedom from my ego for a long time, listening to Alan Watts, Eckhart Tolle, mm -hmm. teachers like that. And, um, I was going through a period of really intense suffering in a relationship. Um, I'd always been very relationship driven. Mm -hmm. uh, very codependent, needed to have a girlfriend to feel good about myself. And so I was with a girl who uh, had a borderline personality disorder. Wow. So we didn't find out until after we were dating. Um, all these, you know, this crazy kind of psychotic issues started appearing. And I was like, this is not normal. Like, we got to get you into a therapist, see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, she had BPD. And um, <clears throat> I was too insecure and codependent at that time on my relationship to stand up for myself and walk away from the relationship like I should have. And so I just allowed her kind of emotional, psychological abuse to go on for a long time because I didn't want to lose the relationship. Like we can work this out. We'll make this work. It'll be worth it in the end. And deep down, I, I resented myself for not having enough self-respect to walk away when I should have. So I was suffering a lot, really, really depressed, yada, yada, yada. And uh, at that time, I was spending my breaks at work. Uh, I worked at Google at the time, and I would go up to uh, a little balcony area above the gym and listen to Eckhart Tolle for like an hour. And it was helping me find some relief from my suffering and stuff. So for a couple of months, I was doing that every single day at work. And so, you know, just another ordinary day going up to the balcony, I was listening to a video with Eckhart. Uh, where he was talking, he was sort of making light of the ego in this clip, and he was he would sort of repeat something the ego says to us in our minds, and then he would chuckle, and the audience would laugh. Um, something like, if only people would be nicer to me, then I could truly be happy. And everybody would laugh. So he did like, you know, four or five different statements like that. And I was laughing because I was recognizing like, oh my God, it's exactly what my ego keeps saying. Yeah. I just wasn't aware of it, right? Um, outcome happiness. <clears throat> and then something sort of clicked, you know, in my consciousness where um, I just had a, a moment of realization, I guess you could say. 
And uh, the way I describe it is like, it was as if I was giving somebody like a tour of my mind and I'm saying, okay, and behind this door is where I am. And so here I am and I open the door and it's this room full of machinery it's just running by itself and there's nobody there. It's just empty machines and computers. And I'm like, wait, but where am I? Like, I'm, this is just means there's nobody here. And I, I got it. Like, oh, the ego doesn't exist. It's conditioning. It's programming. It's not actually what I am. This person who's suffering is actually the idea about who I am. That's my expectations aren't being met. And so the mind doesn't like that because the mind is survival thinking. The ego is. Yeah. Uh, it's developed from evolution, uh, self-preservation thinking. So if it doesn't get the outcomes it wants, it creates suffering as a motivation to keep trying to get that outcome, right? It doesn't matter what the outcome is. Uh, the mind doesn't actually know what the outcome is because it's not a real entity, you know? <clears throat> so I just kind of got it all. And so I just had this moment of just laughing hysterically at the joke of it all, you know? <laughs> it's like, wow, I've been suffering for no reason. Like, what can you do for laugh? And then, uh, you know, the laughter turned into like tears of joy. And uh, I kind of was just in this really weird, not weird, but weird compared to my normal state of consciousness. Uh, I just call it like being blissed out. Um, had those saucer plate eyes, you know, like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> oh, I know. You know, right? So the funny part was I had to go coach my client right after that. And I come down having this crazy Nirvana experience. And I, <laughs> I felt like I floated into the gym, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, show up to my client. Oh my I'm God. Like, hey, and they're like, hi, Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm like, I'm doing amazing. <laughs> like, oh, cool. They're like, what are you on? Let me get some of that. I'm on reality, baby. Yes. <laughs> so I spent two weeks completely blissed out, completely wow. in total joy. Um, it felt as if there wasn't a single thought that floated through my mind for about two weeks. Literally, not exaggerating, went home, sat on the couch like every other night. He comes storming out and she starts screaming and cussing at me. And why didn't you come home sooner? What were you doing? And whatever. And I'm sitting on the couch just in ecstasy. Oh my gosh. Yes. Listening to her do this yes. and seeing, seeing right through the illusion of it, like, oh, she's just a poor victim to her programming. She has no self-awareness. If she did, she wouldn't behave this way. Feeling so much genuine love for her, but not giving in a single iota to her facade of attack and judgment and anger. And literally not even responding to her, not even saying, why aren't you saying anything? Like, because there's nothing to say. Like, I'm so happy. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So I thought that that was going to be my state of consciousness. Because, you know, two full weeks of that, I was like, okay, this is permanent. <laughs> mm -hmm. About that. <laughs> but um, about that. Well, so <clears throat> a part of it was permanent. But long story short, I realized that I needed to break up with her. <clears throat> that the most loving thing for me to do would be to break up with her to allow her to have the space to work on her issues and to love myself enough to not allow this person to abuse me anymore. And so I did. And she, you know, broke down uh, hysteria. Please, baby, don't leave me. I beg, I'll do anything. I'll never yell at you again. You're my everything. Da, da, da. And uh, that hurt me to see her in pain. Mm -hmm. And so it created a, a sense of suffering again. For the first time in a couple of weeks, I, I experienced suffering. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it felt as though that sort of, you could say, dragged me out of the blissed out state. Hmm. And, you know, I knew that knowing now it wasn't ever going to be permanent. Um, but that sometimes happens to people when they have these really powerful awakenings. Hmm. Um, you know, I was working as a f uh, fitness model in San Francisco with a big agency. I was competing in bodybuilding. I dropped everything. I literally wow. walked out of my life. Um, I was like, I don't have any interest in this anymore. I stopped posting shirtless pictures, never posted one ever again. <laughs> I mean, everything about my dynamic changed. So in that moment, there's another potential perspective as to why you were perhaps uh, dragged out of your 
bliss state because of course like you said it does live within you permanently even if Mm -hmm. for whatever reason you are human having this experience perhaps you also needed to have that experience of grief you know when you lose someone when when you uh decide to cut the cord with someone that you love Mm -hmm. that was probably some sort of soulmate in some way for your evolution you know the human itself for the creator to experience all that is also needs to process it. So that's mm-hmm. still part of your totally. awakening to process it. So in a sense, it's not that you ever jumped out of your awakening. It's not that you ever went back to sleep into a zombie no, state. Not at all. No, it's just a part no, of it. Not at all. And that's one yeah. thing that people sometimes get, cause I used to have a hard time when I would get out of those bliss states and I would almost, yeah, I would, I would start to have this negative self-talk like what, who, you know, you, I, you were just so, you were there, you were there, you were just so enlightened. Uh-huh. But then I realized now whenever I do happen to go into like a little bit of a darker time in a sense, not really, but um, that's just part of the process. It really is. Right. The ego's crafty, man. The ego's real crafty. Real it'll, crafty. Real crafty. <laughs> it'll like it'll resist your awakening experience all the way. But then once you're out of it, it'll go, shame on you, you unspiritual person. Why aren't you still experiencing <laughs> that bliss? <laughs> it literally will use anything to possibly get its hands on as leverage. Oh yeah. It's very crafty with his trickery, her trickery. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Um So then when you see or witness other loved ones now, like your family, your friends, and they happen to be living in their old programming, or you see part of the illusion, what do you do now in order to kind of stand in your ground and in your space, but also give them love in some way? Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've changed my perspective so much that at this point, when I it's really hard to describe the more that I see someone who's really lost in an egoic program, <clears throat> man, it's like the compassion just avalanches out of my chest. It's really intense. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful experience, but sometimes it's very intense, but I recognize myself in them so much that I just go, gosh, I, I wish I could give them this understanding I have. Um, but at the same time, there's the recognition that everything is exactly as it should be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, there's no, de- um, there's no egoic desire in me whatsoever to be like, I need to tell this person the truth and wake them up. They need to know <laughs> Hey, your egos are rising. You know, <clears throat> that's not there anymore. It was there for a, a small amount of time, but now it's like, no, they're, they're exactly where they need to be and yeah. they should be acting the way they're acting because mm-hmm. the program is still in place. So everything is happening exactly as it should. And I don't have, there's no personal responsibility for me to awaken this person to the truth or save this person. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing to save them from other than their own suffering. But even their suffering is leading them to their own self-realization, whether in this life or the next. Uh, suffering is kind of what drives the engine of evolution, of consciousness. So there is no compulsion in me to need to help this person there's just this natural intuition um you know the the true self is just so intelligent uh its clarity is like super precise super accurate it can read a situation instantaneously without having to analyze the data you just walk into a situation and it's like all the variables are downloaded and you just find yourself responding in a certain way <clears throat> And it, it almost feels more like, um, I would describe it like a, almost like a stiff arm from inside of me. There's like this stiff arm reaction away from what the ego wants me to do. <clears throat> so like, let's say that somebody is acting egoically and then I feel what my ego wants to do is to give in to their egoic reaction and let's play off one another. That's what egos do, right? Let's mm. enhance each other, whether we're fighting or whether we're complimenting each other, whatever. Uh, <laughs> the egos want to enhance one another. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And so the, my ego still will get triggered to say, oh, tell that person to F off back or whatever. And immediately the true self goes, oh, and it's like this gross type of reaction inside. And so mm-hmm. I find myself sinking into this deep presence 
where I might just not respond or whatever the response is. It just happens through you. You don't think about it whatsoever. Yeah. It's so effortless. And uh, you, bring a, you bring an energy that is what's needed in that moment. Uh, you bring a sense of presence that cuts through their ego, in a sense, mm -hmm. and speaks to their true self and resonates with their true self. Sort of like when you see someone or you meet someone who's super authentic mm -hmm. and you're like, man, that person's just so themselves. Mm -hmm. And you might be you know, still kind of struggling with inauthenticity. Um, but when you see authenticity, it like you can't describe why you love it so much or even what it is, but you, something in you recognizes it and goes, I want that. Yeah. And so you kind of bring that energy to the situation. And that's all you can really do. Yeah. Well, and you're not really reacting to it the old way that you would initially want to. Yes. Now, you've clearly shifted a lot of these old triggers that you said that does happen effortlessly, but I do think that in a sense, there is a conscious decision as well in the moment. Um, so both simultaneously, like, yes, you feel it in your soul and you want to respond to that situation with compassion how you know would be the best way to respond or lack of in that situation but at the same time it does it for you kind of is it kind of a conscious decision since you have reprogrammed a lot so you or when you were in the process of reprogramming did you realize like oh I, this is where i'm going to shift right now and respond differently just mm -hmm. consciously because a lot of people they're probably like how how do i know how to let go of my ego in those situations and listen to that deeper inner wisdom inside that part mm -hmm. can get really confusing and convoluted for a lot of people so how would they be able to decipher the difference? That's a great question. <laughs> so this is a bit of a complicated answer. Um, mm -hmm. I'll answer it in two parts. <clears throat> so you could consider the mind as the doing aspect mm -hmm. and the, the self or the inner being as the being aspect. Um, so at one point in my journey, it did feel like there was a conscious decision or doership of, oh, I could make this decision or that decision, and I choose this one. <clears throat> but so when anyone wakes up from their ego, the awakening experience is the realization that, oh, it's actually not me. It really isn't me. It's actually an automatic, mechanical, reflexive programming that just absorbs me into it when I'm not aware of it. And I find myself blurting out a response. Oh, why did I say that? I didn't mean that, you know. So that's what the initial awakening is. Now, awakening is not liberation. Those are two different things. You can awaken to your ego, but you're not actually free from suffering yet, right? Mm -hmm. You're still suffering on a day-to-day -day basis. Liberation would be the end of suffering, or enlightenment, you could say, is the end of suffering. And that's what everyone is pursuing or desiring. <clears throat> so you realize, oh, okay, anger is arising, uh, judgment is arising, but it's not my doing. So I can be aware of it. And the more awareness is there, the more it dissolves that program. And so then comes a transition period where it feels as if you're making the conscious decision to respond um, from the beingness instead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then as your awakening progresses and you, you develop more and more space within yourself, um, you start to recognize that even the awareness is not a conscious decision on your part. That in the same way that the ego was not a conscious decision on your part, it was always an automatic reaction. Awareness is also automatic, meaning that there isn't ever a moment where I go, you know, I'm, I'd rather be aware right now. Let me be aware of this, right? It never happens. There's just awareness. It's, it's all dependent on how much stillness is inside of you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I, the analogy I like to use is this is why we meditate, right? We're trying to increase the um, atmosphere, let's say, in our consciousness. So let's say there's a rocket ship, right? This is an egoic thought. So if we don't have very much atmosphere or space within ourselves, awareness, the rocket launches and it makes it out of the atmosphere really quick. And then once it's out of the atmosphere, it's, it's running the show. 
Okay. So we meditate and we develop more awareness to expand the atmosphere inside of ourselves. So now the rocket ship gets launched, but it has so much more atmosphere to go through that it runs out of fuel and crashes back down. Mm, Does that make I sense? I like that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of what happens with our thoughts, egoic thoughts. And so it feels as if this expanding awareness is my personal doing or conscious doing but it's really just a result of the expanded awareness. Mm -hmm. But the expanded awareness does the work on its own. I don't actually have to stay on guard all day for my thoughts. I'm, I'm watching you, ego, I'll catch you. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. I just go about my day, <laughs> not thinking about any, any of this. An egoic thought arises, and then my awareness catches it and goes, nope, not interested in that thought. That thought you creates suffering. Away. Yeah. Yep, you can float away. So there's this natural moving away from that thought. So you'll come to the realization eventually that even that isn't my, my as a separate self, my conscious or personal doing. It's just my beingness doing what it does because I, I am awareness, right? So I don't have to do awareness because I am awareness. So it, it feels completely automatic because it is natural. Everything that is natural is effortless, right? A tiger doesn't have to strain to be a tiger. Right? I'm trying so hard to be a tiger. It just is, yeah. Mm -hmm. The concept of isness, and you are pure awareness. And so you only realize that when your awareness expands enough that you see that it's all really happening by itself, which is why there is no sense of guilt. There is no judgment from the universe mm -hmm. because there is no personal doer. It's all a, a result of nature and evolution and programming. You know, everyone's acting out their conditioning. They don't have the self-awareness to behave otherwise. If they did, they would behave otherwise. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like we tell ourselves, that person shouldn't have done that. They should have made a different decision. It's like, <laughs> no, actually they shouldn't have because they didn't. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, man. That's reality. You're ego. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like to impersonate the ego sometimes. <laughs> the ego's great. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> it's interesting that ever since I started to recognize the liberation, the freedom where I do not have to control a situation, because I used to be mm -hmm. quite a control freak, quite a perfectionist. I was like, I mm. have to be this perfect picture at all times. When I was able to just let go of that and recognize that that was part of my ego trying to control all situations in my, ni my life to manipulate a certain outcome for all right. things and let go of forcing anything and just seeing that all as is e even trying to control others in a sense for when I started to understand this stuff perhaps not fully integrating it but just had an understanding of it um right. I would still try to for example, my parents, like get them to see what it, you know, they're, they're very tense people. And so whenever they would tense up, I would react. And now instead being able to see that this is just part of, you know, this just, this really is what is, this is part yeah. of their experience as this is what <clears throat> needed to be experienced for the creator. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen happen in like a year or so from now but i do not need to control this situation it really is just what it is so freeing so liberating it is. yeah yeah 